morning and welcome to our Understanding Loss Control webinar. It's a new webinar for us, so I hope you enjoy it. My name is Zanae Agostini. I'm CEO of CID Insurance Programs, and I want to introduce our three instructors today, uh, Michelle Belden, uh, our nonprofit and commercial uh, new business underwriter, Teresa Cochran, our garage and commercial new business underwriter, and Jessica, who is our commercial renewal underwriter. All three are very experienced, and they have a lot to share on loss control. Last but not least, that's Jacob Cole is our marketing coordinator, and he makes everything run smoothly uh, for these webinars behind the scenes. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about logistics, which is really basic. Um, as in most webinars, uh, you'll be able to uh, hear, but you won't be able to speak. Uh, you will be on mute. So, uh, but your voice is important to us, so please pose your uh, questions in the chat room, and uh, we'll stop and answer them as we go through the webinar. Uh, and we'll have a short survey at the end of the webinar, and would love to get your feedback uh, on how we can improve our webinars going forward. So now for the objectives. What are we going to What are we going to talk about? What are they going to teach you today? Um, we, well, you want to understand the purpose of loss control. Every, it's, it's, it can be very frustrating. Uh, you know, nobody wants to deal with loss control, but if you understand the purpose of it, you could help your insured understand better. And then we we want uh, to look at different uh, types of loss control inspections and the types of policies that usually will have inspections. And then we're going to use some examples uh, so that you could better uh, get the sense of how how to do a better job with loss control. And then um, what, what kind of potential policy changes might happen as a result of loss control findings? Uh, and then, um, last but not least, how can you be more proactive with loss control? Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the team to get started. Hi, everyone. This is Teresa Cochran. Um, so why are loss control inspections performed? Well, because it's a carrier requirement. It's not something we like to uh, do on our own time. Um, but it is a carrier requirement. They want us to make sure we rated the risk properly. Um, we, you know, we will definitely elaborate on this shortly, so I don't want to go into it right now. Um, but just make sure we have everything rated for. Um, we want to see what the condition of the property is, um, what the general housekeeping looks like, how well the, the location is maintained or is not maintained. Um, and the, the inspection will advise on any potential loss-related hazards, um, which again we will we will dive into shortly. Hi everyone, uh, this is Michelle. Um, so I'm going to take over the next few slides um, and just go over the slide here. We're going to type talk about the types of loss control inspections there are. Um, so there are generally three types of inspections: a phone inspection, a physical inspection, and a web inspection. Um, for us as the underwriters in the office, we are definitely doing our own web inspections in addition to the carrier. Um, and then physical inspections, you know, those are going to happen once policy has been bound. And now, uh, depending on the type of risk that it is, we need to go out there and make sure that everything with the building and the property itself is up to what we did when we rated the policy. Um, and then there's phone inspections. Generally, those, you know, apply to um, contractor type risk, you know, ones where, you know, they maybe not have a set location, so we, you know, the, we're going to have the carriers going to call just to confirm the information that we provided to them is accurate. Um, and then with uh, loss control comes with the inspection results. Um, so you can either have mandatory loss control, uh, which is something required by the carrier, has to be completed for them to stay on the policy, or you can have things that are advisory. They're just saying, hey, like bringing this to your attention, but you don't have to comply with it, but it could be beneficial to your insured if they did. And, you know, it's helping them be proactive to try to prevent um, any sort of losses happening on their property. Um, that's really what the advisory um, inspection results are. And then there are different types of risks, like I said, that will be inspected. Um, so you're, it's going to vary. Uh, you know, sometimes if your premium is over a certain amount, the carrier requires an inspection regardless of the type of class that is. Uh, same thing with property limits. 
Um, you know, if your risk is property driven, it's most likely going to have a, an inspection done on the property. Uh, same thing, the sales amount could drive um, the risk having to get an inspection. So those all kind of vary by carrier, but those are general things that we see and when an inspection would be required. Um, so we're going to talk about different types of loss control, and we're going to give you guys some examples. Um, and the ones listed on the screen are the three we're going to go over today, and those are the ones that we generally see most often that will have inspections just because of the type of risk they are. They're generally a little bit more high hazard, um, so there's a little bit more information we're wanting to confirm to make sure it's rated properly, uh, the risk is in good condition, and just to make sure that, you know, we're keeping the insured on the up and up. And then, so just some things that we generally see um, on a regular basis when we get loss control back, either from the carrier or from the inspections uh, we perform with our inspection company. Um, I will tell you the number two, th two things we always get, that they may have fire extinguishers, but they're not either properly mounted or currently tagged. Um, so that is an important thing. That is a warranted condition on pretty much every single one of our quotes. Every risk needs to have a currently tagged and properly mounted fire extinguisher. Um, it's super simple. If you don't have one, you know, you can order one online on Amazon or go to your local hardware store, pick one up, and then there are plenty of servicing companies out there that will come out and service your um, fire extinguishers here in our office. A guy comes once a year. Literally, you can just schedule it and be done, and they will come every year to make sure it's up, and if, it, you know, the codes change, whatnot, they'll just exchange out your fire extinguishers, so that's an important thing to have. And then smoke detectors. Um, every building, commercial or residential, that we are doing has to have smoke detectors installed. They do not have to be hardwired. Again, you can just order them on Amazon or go to your hardware store and the insured can pick them up and then they can be battery operated, but totally fine, not an issue. Um, we get the question sometimes like, it's gonna cost hundreds of thousand dollars to install smoke detectors. That's if you want them hardwired. We don't need that. We're only looking for the battery operated ones to be installed. And then some other things that we see, um, just in general housekeeping, you know, this is the point of like us trying to help the insured to prevent any sort of like GL related claim. Um, so if there's loose items or cords on the floor, you know, making sure that they're um, properly stored when they're not in use and things aren't blocking um, exits, you know, want to make sure all exits are cleared and accessible in the event of an emergency. And then any debris that's, you know, in and around the property, if there's just like a pile of trash for some reason, whatever it may be, you know, just keeping the property clean. Um, and then as well on the exits, it's having the properly installed exit signs. And another thing that we see most often um, with regards to housekeeping is seeing um, potholes or uneven pavement in, you know, in their parking lot, on the sidewalk, uh, whatever it may be. Um, so those are things that, you know, we commonly see and things that will need to be fixed in order to keep us on the risk. So I'm going to go over on the next slide. Um, just some loss control example of habitational risk or on a lesser's risk. Um, like I said, you know, these are property driven risks, so they're generally always going to have an inspection, unless they're a pretty small building. Um, most of the time they are going to have an inspection. Uh, so what are we checking with this loss control when the inspectors go out there? Well, we're looking for the condition of the building. You want to know, we want to make sure the building is in good condition, you know, isn't falling over, um, doesn't have holes in it for some reason, you know, we're just looking to make sure that the building is maintained and it's what we assumed it was when we quoted the risk. And then also if uh, it's, you know, it's an older building and we were provided with updates uh, on our accords, we're looking to confirm that those updates have been made. Um, so that's something that an inspector will ask about, about the roof update, the electrical, the plumbing, the heating, you know, ask the type of plumbing and electrical that there is. Those are questions that are definitely going to be asked. And the type of electrical system, that is definitely going to be checked because that's really important to us because there are a handful of prohibited uh, electrical systems and wiring types that we cannot accept with our carriers. Um, some examples of those would be uh, buildings with aluminum wiring, uh, buildings with knob and tube wiring, um, anything with fuses, uh, the Federal Pacific stab lock type electrical panels, the Zinsco electrical panels. Uh, to name a few. So those are some um, types of electrical systems that are prohibited with us. So, you know, if we confirm that beforehand and then we get the inspection back and find out that that building has them, the insurance are going to have to update it before um, or we're going to have to get off the risk because those are prohibited with the carrier. So then we would have to be, the carrier would require us to get off the risk since that's something that they can't control. 
Um, another thing that we will look at, this is generally going to apply more to like apartments or condos um, or railings if they're multiple story buildings. Uh, we're looking to see if they have vertical railings or horizontal railings and how wide the railing width is. Um, horizontal railings pose an issue for most carriers uh, because they act like a step ladder. So that would be um, if there was horizontal railings present as a loss control recommendation, the carrier would suggest putting in some sort of like wire mesh in front of that so that way you couldn't climb and use that as a step ladder. Um, again, with the habitational things that you're going to see, if there's a swimming pool on premise or a playground, you know, just making sure that that pool is fully fenced with a self-latching gate. Um, and then if there is a playground, making sure there's some sort of soft surface underneath. Uh, these are important things to be um, on the lookout for and what the inspector is going to confirm for us when we review our inspection. And then also if there's any vacancies, because um, that will take into account our rating factors as well. All right, on the restaurant side, the main thing I see are not having contracts in place with a third party company to clean and maintain the hood and duct system and the anvil system that are over, that are over the cooking equipment. Um, those are a must because if those things are not maintained and cleaned like semi-annually, huge fire hazards. Um, another, another item is the deep fat fryer. Uh, those can be cleaned by employees. However, they need it to, the deep cap fryer either needs to be 16 inches away from an open flame or separated by a stainless steel barrier. Um, if that doesn't happen, that's, you know, a cause for a grease fire. Um, and the last thing on the restaurants is ha actually having proof that the systems have been serviced. Um, just like with the fire extinguisher, um, they should be tagged. Um, Anytime a third party company is cleaning the hood and duct system or the anvil system, automatically should be tagged. Um, if not, at least have a copy that a copy of the receipt or the cleaning contract for the inspection so that that's not um, an additional thing that's listed, listed out. And the garage, uh, let's see, garage is trip and fall is a big, um, a big hazard. So oil stains definitely need to be cleaned up. Um, the non-smoking signs need to be posted because smoking can cause a fire hazard with all the oil um, and soiled rags that, that are around the business. Um, so soiled rags need to be placed in a UL approved metal container um, and also any other flammable materials. These metal containers and cabinets can be found online. Um, you know, you can go to Lowe's, you can go to Home Depot and pick them up. Um, but they are also available on, you know, Amazon. Hi, everyone. This is Jessica. So as we mentioned, one of the main reasons for an inspection is to make sure the risk is rated properly. So this list provides the common rating factors that we see that could result in an endorsement. So for example, if we bound a policy on um, 500,000 in annual sales, but the inspection states that the sales are at a million, then we would be processing an endorsement to increase the sales. Another common one we see is when we have an older building where full updates were provided at time of bind, um, making the insured eligible for special form, but the inspection confirms that the only update has been, let's say, to the roof, and all other utilities are original. We would have to process an endorsement to amend the property coverage to basic form since they don't have those necessary updates to be eligible for special. And then if there are any discrepancies noted on the inspection that don't appear accurate, please reach out to us so we can work on getting that result. Okay, in some situations we do have to issue a cancellation or a non-renewal on the account based on the inspection findings. So, this could be for numerous reasons, such as we discover that there's an eligible tenant and therefore we have to issue a cancellation. Or maybe an inspection identifies an exposure that we need more information on, but we don't get that information needed, so we have to issue out a cancellation. So for example, let's say we have an auto dealer risk where the inspection identifies an employee that we were not originally rating for. Uh, we would be asking for their motor vehicle record in order to rate for them properly. So if we don't receive that necessary information, um, this could also result in the need to issue out a cancellation. 
Um, or there are other instances where we may not have received any compliance or only partial compliance, and therefore we have to issue out a notice of non-renewal. So depending on what the loss control requirements are, this could also lead to a notice of cancellation. It really just depends on what items are required and the carrier's guidelines. And then I would also like to note that if we do have to issue out a cancellation, but we could have another potential market that could accommodate the exposure, then we will always do our best to try and replace coverage for the insured. Okay, so with complying with loss control, we're really looking for two things. So for the insured to sign the compliance form, acknowledging the items that they have complied with, as well as providing proof of completion for all items. So for example, like we mentioned, the fire extinguishers are a big one. So if let's say they had expired tags, then we would be looking for the signed compliance form stating that they had the fire extinguishers serviced, as well as like a photo of the new tag or a receipt from the company who serviced the fire extinguisher. So if we do get just a signed compliance form back, but not the actual proof that they've been completed, whether that be photos, contracts, or any other form of proof we may need, then we will be going back to you asking for these items in order to be in full compliance. So last but not least, how to be proactive with your loss control. Um, so creating a follow-up system is a great way to ensure, you know, that the insured stays on top of it and complies with everything. Um, us in our office, we will send out the uh, initial loss control to you, and then we generally send about uh, one to three follow-ups, depending on the due date of the loss control. So, you know, once we send you a follow-up, then follow up with your insured, and you can create a system based off of our system. Um, and then if you have any questions or concerns, like Jessica said, about the loss control, or if you disagree with something that's stated in the loss control, please reach out to us. We are happy to help um, and work with you, uh, try to understand, you know, where the possible disconnect could be or, you know, this, what information was provided and maybe there was just some miscommunication so we can help the insured be able to, you know, continue to have insurance through our office. Um, so just please, please reach out to us. A lot of times people just ignore our loss control and then, like Jessica said, we either have to get off the risk or we have to uh, end up non-renewing the policy. Um, so if there's just an issue, please, please reach out and we'll do our best to work with you. Um, you know, there is a, a deadline on the loss control, but if additional time is needed, um, again, reach out to us and we can work with the carrier um, to get some additional time for them. You know, we'll generally ask you, like, okay, how much how much more time do they think they need? Or, you know, if this is something that requires a, a contractor to come out, if they have, a, like, a timeline for that. We're happy to work with the carrier, and the carrier will work with us, too, as long as we're providing them with enough information um, to not just make it look like we're stalling. We're just looking to be able to help the insured complete everything that they're being required of. Um, so that's um, how to be proactive. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ana, and thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Well, what a great job you did, really good information. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, it's uh, For those of you that are doing business with us, you know how great these uh, three underwriters are uh, and how, how well they take care of you. And for those of you that are uh, new to CID, uh, please uh, submit s some uh, applications to our team and see how well they take care of you. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat room and we will get back to you even after the webinar. Uh, and make sure you visit our, our website. It's a great source. Uh, all of our applications are there and lots of other broker tools are available. And our, um, our webinars are there as well. We have uh, this, this webinar will be recorded and put up uh, probably sometime today. And you can go back and watch it or have other people in your office watch it or go watch any of our webinars. There's so many of them on different coverages and different classes of business. Uh, so uh, submit your applications today, submissions at cidinsurance.com, and um, we look forward to doing business, uh, more business with you. Thanks for joining us.